Good evening, everyone. Welcome to beautiful downtown Grand Forks. This is Grand Forks City Council's Committee of the Whole for Monday, August 22nd, under item one, call to order 1.1. Welcome and roll call. Weigel? Here. Wasowski? Here. Weber? Here. Lunsky? Here. Kavami? Sandy? Here. And Veen? Here. We have a quorum. Great. Under item two, discussion items, item 2.1, budget amendment, health uh, department, public health emergency response, COVID-19, public health, workforce supplemental funding. Ms. Swanson, good evening. Council President Sandy and members of the Committee of the Whole, you have before you a budget amendment. Um, this funding was provided to the Grand Forks Public Health Department in the City of Grand Forks to continue our public health emergency response related to COVID. Um, this is supplemental workforce funding that's provided um, by the North Dakota Department of Health. It supports four positions in our department and all the information is on the staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any from council members. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Wasowski. Hi, Ms. Swanson. Um, what is your budget now, including this $200,000? Uh, council President Sandy, members of the committee, um, Council Member Wasowski, are you asking me what our total budget is yes. for the health department? Yes. Our total budget is, um, it, it varies between five and seven million dollars and it depends on some of the fluid funding that is coming in and being expensed from the health department. Okay, so when we get grants like this, which are awesome, are we able to allocate some of those dollars elsewhere then? Um, some of the like taxpayer funded money that you guys get? Uh, or is this just additional funds? Uh, Council Member Soski, this money actually replaces funding that we had that has been expensed. So we uh, responded to the COVID um, pandemic with some federal funding that we received as passed through from the state. One um, stream of that funding has ended. We have completely expensed it. This funding is to continue some of those positions. Um, so it doesn't replace any of our workforce that are funded by the health department because they're doing other public health work. Okay, um, are we still even in a COVID pandemic? Um, Council Member Osowski, there are still a number of cases being reported regularly. Our positivity rate on our COVID testing is as high as it was during January. That is, however, related to the fact that many more people are testing at home. So we have high positivity rates. Uh, we still are seeing a number of cases. The good news is that people are not getting as sick and not needing hospitalizations, and we're not seeing the deaths. That's largely related to some of the um, treatments that are available. Okay, it says that this funding will be used for COVID testing and vaccination, data collection, communication, emergency response coordination, and surveillance. Um, so my question is, is what kind of data are you collecting and what kind of surveillance are you doing with this money? Surveillance activities can take the form of everything from wastewater testing, which is done by others. We report it in our dashboard. Surveillance is also noting the number of cases and looking for trends so that when COVID numbers go up, we know whether or not our response needs to be augmented. So that's what surveillance is. Data collection is simply reporting the numbers that are reported to us from testing sites and from the North Dakota Department of Health. Okay, um, I believe that the CDC just came out and said that testing is not required. So, but we're gonna still continue to push that with these funds? Council Member Osowski, I don't know that the CDC that said that testing is not required. Quarantine is no longer required. So if you've been exposed, you do not need to quarantine. Testing and isolation are still recommended. We continue our testing operations at uh, UND. That's our centrally located Grand Forks site. So we're doing testing there. We're also ensuring that residents across the community have access to home test kits. That's a very important part of our strategy right now. So we're constantly replenishing those supplies throughout the community is when you're talking about UND is that the only place that really you guys operate from then like at, I'm assuming it's that place right by the Ingolstadt correct that is correct okay. uh, it is the the Fritz Pollard high performance center we operate the testing site there in collaboration with the North Dakota Department of Health UND and Altru. Altru provides this the PCR testing for us 
and then we do um, all of the testing operations are coordinated by Grand Forks Public Health Department. And the vaccine, the vaccine portion, the vaccination portion also, do you guys coordinate that or is that something that patients and doctors discuss together? Council Member Oselski, we do some COVID vaccinations along with many of our community partners that include Altru, um, Sanford Health, pharmacies, long-term care organizations. We have many partners in the community that are administering COVID vaccine. This funding provides us with the ability to have that infrastructure in place to provide our own vaccinations and also coordinate with our providers. So do you guys, um kind of medical staff gives the vaccinations that are provided by your Department of Health, correct? That's correct. Grand Forks Public Health Department employs public health nurses that administer okay. the vaccine under a standing order from Dr. Joel Walls, who is our health officer. Do they ensure that people who are receiving these vaccines, um, do they ensure that they are knowledgeable and even inform that they're not FDA approved yet? Uh, we do distribute information to all of our participants. Are you speaking of the patients that receive the vaccine? Yeah, from yeah. the nurses, the COVID nurses that you guys are talking. The nurses are educated on all of the vaccines, the emergency use authorization, and in some cases, the vaccines that we are giving are fully FDA approved. There are some that are still under emergency use authorization because that's a process with the FDA. Our staff are trained and we provide everyone with an information sheet prior to receiving the vaccine and also uh, ask if they have any questions. Okay, one last question. Um, what happens to the samples that are taken from the patients when they are given a COVID test? Come like saliva on. samples, um, no swabs, whatever is being done these days. All of the samples are uh, collected in a, a sharps container and they are disposed of according to the guidance that we receive. And we use an organization out of Fargo that comes and picks those up and incinerates them. Okay, so they are destroyed. They are, they are disposed okay, of. Yes, thank you. Nothing is saved. Thank you. Good. Any other comments or questions? Move approval. Moved by Weigel. Is there a second? Second. Second by Osowski. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.2, appointments, reappointments for Board of Health and Pension and Insurance Committee. Any comments or questions re regarding Dr. Bradley for the Board of Health or Michael Vattensdahl for the Pension and Insurance Committee? Moved by Weigel. Is there a second by Veen? Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Item 2.3, ordinance to establish the Tech Accelerator Board. Ms. Richards, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Sandy. Um, I'm here to um, start the process to adopt an ordinance to establish a Tech Advisory, Tech Accelerator Advisory Board, excuse me. This would be um, similar to function of the Growth Fund Committee only um, it would be advisory to the JDA as it relates to operations of the Tech Accelerator facility that is currently under construction um, across the street at the former Grand Forks Herald building. Um, thanks to Mr. Gosted, we have a, a draft ordinance in front of you that um, spells it out as a 11-member um, board, non, nine voting members, two non-voting. Um, primarily, the membership is ex officio. Um, as, as your staff report has them numbered with um, 11 representatives, um, the first six are all ex officio, um, then the seven through 11 would be nominated by the mayor with approval by um, city council. Ms. Richards, how'd you come up with these 11? First of all, why are we, why are we building a board of 11 people? Um, well, it's meant to have a, a broad reach across our partners and um, kind of tech industries. It is advisory in nature and, and tech is a fast changing environment. So we do want to have um, knowledgeable people in various fields in place on the board. Uh, admitted, 11 is a big number. Mm. What? What? Why do we have... Why do we have non-voting members on the board? If they're permanent members of the board, why are they non-voting? Um, we have 
recommended that the Center for Innovation and Evolve be non-voting because we are considering having a contractual relationship with them for um, programming and or um, space management of the facility. We didn't want to create a, a conflict of interest by having a, a voting member that would then have to recuse him or herself on, on those matters. So that's the logic behind that. Got it. Mm -hmm. Council President, yep. I think uh, I think there will be a lot of work up front because we're going to be starting up this facility with um, you know tech accelerator program and also up some upscaling. But I think once it's up and going, I think then we can revisit with the board and, and what things are. But I think this board will have to be pretty active at the start as we as we really ramp up the programming and how this facility is going to operate. And then I would say within a year or two, we'd come back to obviously give you updates at the JDA and, and then determine, you know, how do we really want to operate moving forward? Sure. Any, anyone else have any questions? What, 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 and I'm fine with the president of the JDA, but why not the chair of the growth fund? Because the chair of the growth fund is, is, the growth fund is making the recommendations to the JDA, right? Well, in this case, the growth fund committee won't be involved in Advise, advising the JDA on the Tech Accelerator. The, the Tech Accelerator Advisory Board will be like the Growth Fund Committee, only limiting its advice to Tech Accelerator operations rather than loan programs. Sounds good. Any, anyone else? Lord Mr. Lord. Rigel moves approval. Is there a second? Second by Veen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Nice. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. 2.4, accept the fiscal year 2022-53-39 B funding for bus and bus facilities program. Good evening, Mr. Bergman. Good evening, President Sandy and members of the council. Um, we got a surprise here last Monday in regards to funding that we had applied for. A uh, little to my surprise, which I was figuring we probably wouldn't see it for the first seven years. And he had given us a call in regards to this uh, funding to do our building. And it is a 90% federal funding, 10% local match that we ended up getting. Most of them are an 80-20 match. It's great. It's, uh, it was very surprising to see, see this and hear about it in the staff report. Anybody have any comments or questions? Move by Dean, second by Weber. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Mr. Bergman shows the uh, depth and breadth of what you did on your original application. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you for that. <coughs> I'm 2.5, State of North Dakota wa Water Funding Resolution. Mr. Phelan. Council President uh, Sandy and members of the community hall, um, Dan, and I are, Dan and I are going to share kind of an overview slide that will kind of speak to this specific uh, financial resolution. And also, we have several staff members that are going to talk about the specific task uh, orders that are going to come. But we thought we'd give you an over, overview of kind of where we are from a financial project perspective. Um, tonight, we're going to speak about uh, this particular area. So I just want to highlight, you know, the project one more time. You know, um, we're going to give, they're going to, we're going to talk about the Fufong site. Obviously, this is the adjacent Highway 81 uh, commercial area. Um, remember with the raw water, raw water starts at the, the intake um, with some upgrades. Uh, we're going to uh, propose to build a pump station adjacent to our, where our new water treatment plant is. And then we're going to build, build two uh, raw water lines to, to the Agri Business Park and, and Fufong itself. Um, tonight, also, we're going to be talking about wastewater treatment plant improvements, both on um, phase one and two upgrades. And that's not only for the Fufong project, but also for generally the city of Grand Forks. Also going to discuss uh, this force main. Um, and this evening, we're going to talk about two pump stations, one a, a domestic uh, pump station, and the other one will be a more of an industrial um, booster station that will serve Fufong and will have the ability to serve the other agribusinesses in the area over a longer period of time. Um, we're going to update you quickly on there's three areas on Highway um, 2 and 81 on some transportation improvements that we've, we've had a meeting on with the DOT. And then finally, uh, we know that the North Dakota Industrial Commission in the, in the a Natural Gas Pipeline Authority is working on a, a pipeline um, coming from Minnesota into the site. So 
Uh, you can see that a lot yes, of things that right. are transpiring are moving forward, and, and you'll hear some a uh, lot of the city projects of how we move forward um, today. Um, Ms. Osowski had a good comment earlier in the day, is that it's important to note that there's two um, pipelines uh, for natural gas. One's coming from um, West East, and that's kind of the, the holy grail of what uh, the state of North Dakota is trying to do, moving a natural gas pipe. A pipeline out of either Williston or Tioga um, to eastern North Dakota. Ho hopefully, presumably, that pipeline would make its way to Fargo and to Grand Forks. And then um, that was the 150 million that was set aside. Of that 150 million, 10 million was set aside for this pipeline right here. So, when you look at this pipeline coming from the Viking One Oak, um, that's the the 10 million that's meant to, for the state of North Dakota to subsidize that natural gas. Uh, coming to North Dakota, um, there is um, there was no proposals on on the natural gas pipeline coming from Western North Dakota. Uh, I suspect the state of North Dakota is going to have to uh, really take a deeper dive on how much more they want to subsidize that. They do need a large user on this side of the state to really make it uh, cost justified above and beyond what the state's willing to subsidize. That would be something like Northern Plains Nitrogen, something really large that would use that. As we move forward, we do have one proposal that the North Dakota Industrial Commission is reviewing, and that's the uh, One Oak Viking Pipeline Authority. And so they've created a subcommittee that's reviewing that, and ultimately the Industrial Commission, as led by Governor Burgum, will have to approve that. Um, there is an Industrial Commission meeting um, this month, so I'm not sure it's going to get final approved, that $10 million subsidy this month, or if it may carry over into next month's meeting. Just want to highlight all the, what the team is doing, and, and we're going to talk about these kind of in, in silo later with uh, the various uh, city staff. But I would just want to really highlight along this 27th Avenue North um, corridor, um, we'll have a, all the water related functions. And so this is going to be a really a busy uh, uh, corridor that we're going to be working under uh, for all the underground utilities. And that will include the Viking One Oak natural gas pipeline is, is proposed to go down this 27th Avenue North pipeline. I spoke of two wastewater pump stations, and tonight we're going to talk about the wastewater uh, booster station that's going to serve Fufong, and it's also going to have the pot potential to use um, to incorporate other agribusiness in our area, whether it's Greenfield in this Corinta area, or in, in a longer term future, you could also incorporate um, JR Simplot and others. The intent of this station here is really to segregate uh, industrial wastewater flows from domestic because we don't want to we don't want to mix human uh, waste with some of the agribusiness and development. So that's the intent of this. This uh, in green here is meant as the, the domestic wastewater treatment or pump station, and that's really to serve not only the Fufong um, non-industrial uh, wastewater, but also to serve the adjacent uh, Highway 81 um, area. And then you can see along the way, there's going to be a lot of water and sewer lines that are going to are meant to serve uh, the various properties, including up uh, Highway 81. And I just want to go over the time frame. And, and as, as you can see here, 2023, and we're going to look at, uh, when we look at our Gantt chart, really 2023 is really to get a lot of the underground. And you can see most of that underground is going to be centered on 27th Avenue North as well as in and around the stormwater detention pond in this area to, to really get that under uh, underground um, utilities in. And, and when we talk about underground utilities, that's water, wastewater, stormwater, underground utilities will be going in there. I suspect the natural gas pipeline will also be in a similar time frame. So when we're putting on underground water, the natural gas pipeline will also want to be served uh, along this area too. We are proposing, and a lot as as part of this stormwater detention pond, that we would build an access point off of uh, 33rd Avenue North uh, to help us with the construction of this detention pond, and also allow Fufong to have a construction access into their uh, particular site. 2024 is um, is intended that uh, we would get the underground utilities would be in on 27th Avenue North corridor. And then we'd look at paving improvements along that, that corridor. So that would consume a lot of 2024. Then also, as well as that, we'd look at underground utilities on the Highway 81 corridor, as well as the corridor that's more in this, um, more in the Greenfield area. So that, that was how we would spend our 2024. And then 2025 is really trying to wrap up some of the, 
the um, outskirts of, of the development from paving, uh, looking at how we need to improve 30th Avenue North and 33rd Avenue North, what kind of improvements we want to make on those, kind of those supporting avenues, and then finishing some of the water main that goes along Highway 81 um, in and around where the op construction site is. So that's our three-year build that we're looking at, and that and this really breaks it down and breaks it down into the um, various time frames. And so really the important part in green, you have approved these task orders this evening. Um, we're going to be asking you to move forward with these yellow task orders. And at some point in the, in the, um, later in time, we're going to come back and with the remaining task orders, 8 through 13. So really we're kind of in the middle of the area of trying to look to design. The important part I want to point out here is um, we intended uh, some of this infrastructure like the sanitary sewer trying to bid that this fall we've, we've pushed off some of the bidding dates into next year so really all we're looking at bidding um, this fall into the winter uh, as, as we've told you is the stormwater pond which is right up here and the intent of doing that stormwater detention pond is we really want we need to build that uh, with or without Fufong as, as you know the other thing is uh, as Mr. Grasser has been up here it's, it's better to build that during the winter than um, waiting until next year. So that's an early out. Today, we're, uh, tonight, we're also going to talk about the wastewater treatment plant, and that's another project that we intend to have some early out um, bidding, and that's a lot of supply chains, trying to get some of that equipment available so that we can complete our wastewater treatment plant improvements in a, in a timely fashion, and that's under that construction manager at risk. Most of the other bids that we're looking at currently are in this um, March time frame. And so you'll, you'll see designs going between now and, and through the winter and with likely a, a win, late winter bid with a, a March um, bid acceptance and approval by, by the city council. And you can see even down here in the ones that we're re requesting today beyond the wastewater treatment facility that those are gonna be a March approval date. And then you can see even the further out ones are even beyond um, next spring. So just get a sense of what's coming your way as we look at timelines. Again, um, this evening, uh, you're going to have in front of you Christian Danielson um, from our engineering department is going to be up here talking about this. And then also Carmen Severson from our, our, our engineering department will be talking about uh, these this evening. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about these wastewater treatment plant improvements. And then we have some consultants here if there's any specific questions on, that, on these tonight. We've been working, uh, as you know, um, this is really a state local um, funding and project as we, as we have moved forward. And so I'm just highlighting the key state agencies that we've been working with, obviously the DOT on the transportation side. And then there's uh, from the State Water Commission to DEQ to BND to PFA. These are the agencies we've been working more on the water related funding uh, component parts. And then these are, the, these are the programs that we've been working under um, regarding that. Uh, we did have, uh, um, just highlighting all these various funding loan programs. These are kind of coming into fruition, so we're, we're going to be working higher. If I go from left to right, um, the drinking water SRF, SRF program, we're going to be looking at for the, the water main that's being um, placed in there. That's where we would use SRF um, loan funds. Um, that's for drinking water, potable water. The clean water SRF program is for, um, obviously the name is for clean water, but that's otherwise would known as wastewater or stormwater. So this is really where we're looking at for drinking water, These the clean waters for wastewater, stormwater. There are two um, state programs and you know, the state of North Dakota um, funding, they really wanna push it to these programs because these are pass-through funding. And especially with the latest um, bipartisan infrastructure loan program, both of these programs, um, SRF programs, are going to receive um, significant sums of funds for these programs. The challenge with uh, working with the SRF programs is they come with all the federal strings attached to them. So we're really trying to look at, uh, despite having really attractive terms at 2% up to 30 years, uh, some of them have some challenging bidding requirements. So we're looking through that. As we talked about the sanitary sewer collection, as the city agreed to pay 100% of that, as you recall, but we really are gonna work at the important po point of this is this potential loan forgiveness. And right now, as part of that, uh, the federal statute, it does allow up to 49% loan forgiveness. And so we are gonna um, be working with the state to try to get uh, almost half of, the, of those uh, loans forgiven over time. And obviously argue that it's an infill area, having a, a, a sanitary sewer system that we're gonna 
develop and build in that area is better than what we have for septic systems. We also are going to talk with the state of North Dakota regarding this infrastructure loan program, and that's through the Bank of North Dakota. We still have about, we have $25 million of bonding capacity in that program left. So, and that can be used for all of our water related activities and transportation. So we'll be working with the state on how we can access our remaining 25 million. And obviously another attractive program at 2% 30 years. And this program, because it is a state local program, it doesn't have all the federal strength. So when in doubt, we want to try to steer ourselves to this. And then finally, this water infrastructure loan program is another really great program that is through the State Water Commission and it's a state uh, level program. So it's a 2% up to 40 year program. Likely this is the program we're gonna ask the state of North Dakota as you recall on the raw water supply where the state has committed 60% funding on grant that we will ask for 40, or the remaining 40% 40 under, under these terms, which is 2% 40 years. These are the same loans that we recently received for the Red River Valley Water Supply Project too, in this category too. So we'd rather stay in these categories and um, we'll likely have to get in these, but we really are gonna work with the state. The state's created a, a really um, good, um, for lack of a better term, a one-stop shop. So when you go to them, they're gonna try to get you in the best possible way to finance our various pro um, water-related programs that we have moving forward. Um, I mentioned this, we are not only looking at financing terms, but uh, we have received commitments both for on the raw water side and also the drinking water side from the North Dakota uh, State Water Commission for our 60% cost share. So we'll continue to work into this category. And then we've also had a recent meeting at the North Dakota DOT on grant cost share. So those are two state programs that, um, where they'll actually provide us grant funding. Uh, city staff, um, we, we had a really productive meeting last week with the North Dakota DOT and with their leaders. So we met with uh, Ron Hankey and Jennifer Turnbull who are now the current leaders of uh, the North Dakota DOT and provided them an overview. And so uh, basically what they've done is uh, what they can see with these um, various improvements that we need regarding the Fufong project, whether it's on Highway 2 and 42nd or whether it's on Highway, Highway 2 and Highway 81 or up here on 27th and uh, 81, they've all agreed, and that's about a million dollars worth of capital improvements. They, they have agreed to work with us since those are on state highways and, and find funds to, to pay for those um, improvements. They also said there's no guarantees in light, but they would look at ways that they could help support the construction of 27th Avenue North from a, a funding perspective. So they didn't have anything offhand, but they have committed to helping us uh, fund those improvements that are on state highways and, and those improvements on 27th. They, they said, they didn't say yes or no, but they would um, look to help work with us on the project. We do have meetings set up with all the various uh, state water related um, um, departments in August and September. And so we'll meet, as I said, we'll be meeting with the State Water Commission, the North Dakota DEQ, Bank of North Dakota and Public Finance uh, Authority. So we'll be looking at these various opportunities and, and bringing you back the best options that we can working with our state partners. Um, the, the critical path that we're really on, you know, this is embedding the schedule that we're on. Um, the, the blue is really where the state of North Dakota is determining um, what they're gonna do with these various programs. The state is, is going to receive, whether it's DOT funds or state water funds are gonna receive significant additional funds and what they're working on right now is how to best program those funds to locals. And so really they're at this point right now, I, we would anticipate by the green stars right here that they would have program guidance for us. And the important part of this is that this is when we're looking at bidding these various projects in this area. So um, we're working with the state water related departments in advance so that we'll know the, what's the best way to bid these projects and fund them in advance of you, us coming back here and asking you to approve those bids. And so I think we're in pretty good shape on all of those to have a kind of a clear sale of, of what the programs and what the best funding categories um, that are in front of us. I've also asked Dan if he wouldn't mind updating this. All this kind of relates to our development agreement we have in advance um, and specifically related not only to the annexed area but also the full fund to just give you an update on how, how our development agreement plays into all these funding categories. Sure. Uh, Council President Sandy and, and members of the council, um, 
One, before I get into uh, the letter of credit and the escrow agreements, I just wanted to give a quick update on some of the uh, legal developments that have occurred. As you know, last week there was a hearing on the uh, litigation regarding the petition. Um, that was held last Thursday. Um, as I understand, the, the hearing went to, as, as planned. Uh, nothing uh, out of the ordinary occurred. Um, and at this point, the judge took the matter, Judge Foudy took the matter under advisement and, and would expect him to issue a written opinion sometime in the near future. I can't predict exactly when that will occur, but uh, it's in the hands of Judge Foudy at this point. Uh, the only, the other litigation matter is the annexation. Um, uh, Dennis Cadillac uh, brought an action with respect to the annexation and brought a motion for a restraining order to uh, preclude the annexation from going forward. Um, that hasn't been obviously been issued yet. It was just a motion requesting it. That hearing is, is set for October 3rd of uh, 2022 here in Grand Forks in front of Judge Hager. Uh, with respect to uh, the matters, uh, as far as the letter of credit, I just want to kind of back up a little bit and provide a little bit, maybe re-educate some of the council members that have been here before and to educate the, the new members. Um, the letter of credit uh, exists under the development agreement. It has to, Fufang has to keep that in place until uh, both of the following are met, that the Grand Forks plant is substantially completed and they've paid um, costs and expenses that would have been incurred before uh, special assessment districts have been created. There were some costs that um, uh, were incurred before the special certain special assessment districts were created, those costs can't be incorporated within the assessment district, and, and Fufang would would pay that portion. Um, substantially completed means that the plant is utilized for its intended purpose, and uh, that it's in operation and producing saleable product. That determination is made by the following individuals: the city engineer, city planner, city inspector city fire code official, city waterworks administrator, and the city administrator have to determine that the Grand Forks plant is substantially completed. Uh, and that would be then, once that occurs and those, those funds are paid, then the letter of credit can be uh, dismissed or, or removed. The, the qualification, the requirement for that uh, goes away. Um, as I've reported, the letter of credit was issued uh, on June 24th of 2022. Uh, the original is with the finance department. The bank is MUFG Bank Limited out of New York. Um, also, just as a reminder, if you recall, there are qualifications uh, for that uh, bank uh, to, that they had to be subject to U.S. banking laws and had to meet certain standards and pores and Moody's investment criteria. We've uh, uh, verified that both those qualifications were met by this particular bank. Um, the letter of credit automatically renews on an annual basis. So each June 24th, it is to renew until that uh, point in time when it's, uh, the plant is substantially completed. There is an exception, and this was uh, at the request of the bank, that they can provide a no what's called a non-renewal notice. Um, that has to be received 60 days in advance of each June 24th. So if my math is right, to about April 24th, the city would have to receive that non-renewal notice in order for the bank to cause the letter of credit not to be automatically renewed. At that point, Fufang would have a couple of options. First, they would, uh, within 30 days after we received that notice, uh, they could deposit $5 million into an account um, in order basically to replace the letter of credit. Alternatively, um, if they do, don't do that within that 30-day time period, uh, then within 45 days after we receive that notice, which would still be within that 60-day time frame, uh, they could replace a letter of credit under the same terms and conditions that we currently have. Um, if they don't uh, uh, renew or deposit those funds, then the city would, would have the opportunity to draw on that letter of credit for $5 million. And that gets me to my next point is when can the city draw on the letter of credit? Um, if there's a termination of the agreement by the city uh, because the conditions haven't been satisfied would be an event that the city could uh, draw on that $5 million letter of credit. Also, if Fufang would happen to terminate the agreement because the conditions that they have aren't satisfied, the city would be able to uh, draw on that letter of credit as well. If there's a default 
by Fufang under the development agreement. That's another event that the city can draw on the letter of credit. And finally, uh, if we receive this non-renewal notice uh, from the bank uh, that they're not going to automatically renew the letter of credit, um, and Fufang does not then either deposit that those funds or does not receive or we do not receive a a, uh, a replacement letter of credit, uh, we can then draw on that five million dollars. Um, one of the things that, that was also incorporated was that if at that time, for example, if there's a non-renewal um, or, and we draw on the letter of credit, or Fufang decides to deposit uh, money, uh, the $5 million, if there's no other event of termination or event of default at that particular time, we would take those funds and place them in, put them into an escrow account and basically replace the letter of credit, and that would serve as, as our financial security going forward. Um, those changes, that non-renewal provision, that was, if you recall, we then ended up amending the development agreement uh, because the development agreement did not, uh, it, the original development agreement did not call for uh, the ability of the city to draw on the letter of credit if there's, there, there is non-renewal. So to make the letter of credit in the development agreement consistent, we amended uh, uh, the development agreement to allow for the city to draw on the, on the letter of credit as the bank uh, requested. Um, and this then goes into what's being discussed tonight is what's, what's covered by the letter of credit or those replacement funds if uh, Fufang decides to deposit the $5 million or get a replacement letter of credit. If we draw on those funds, what, what could the city use it for? Uh, there are consulting costs uh, that are being incurred now. Uh, A2S, Black and Beach are assisting the city in their review process. Uh, those costs are, would be covered. Um, the pre-assessment costs that we talked about, uh, those costs and expenses that would, would have been incurred before the special assessment district has been created, um, that then can't be uh, incorporated within a special assessment, those would be covered. Um, and here's the, the point for tonight is the cost for drafting infrastructure plans um, or reviews of the Fufang plant uh, that either are not covered already in those consulting costs or aren't recovered through funds with the raw water es escrow, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit, or the wastewater escrow uh, accounts. Um, and then there is other uh, provisions as far as uh, refund costs. If we have, to, there's uh, the county is contributing three million dollars of their ARPA funds for the wastewater facility. Um, if we receive those funds, uh, they may ask for that back. So the letter of credit is is to cover those items as well. So it's 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 all costs that the city incurred under the agreement, including those that I've just described. Um, and and going into now the the raw water and the wastewater escrow accounts. Um, under the terms of the development agreement, once we get to a spot where we're um, bidding uh, the contract for the construction of uh, either the raw water or the wastewater facilities, uh, the Fufang then has to deposit uh, funds to pay for their proportionate share of those particular projects. Um, it's called, it's defined as developer's raw water infrastructure obligation or wastewater infrastructure obligation. And that means, it's defined to mean all the costs, expenses, and fees for both the design and construction of those two uh, infrastructure components. So whatever the costs are for the design and construction of the raw water and the wastewater uh, facilities. And it's their proportionate amount. Um, it's called the developer's primary benefit proportion. So it, in, in the context, the raw water facility is primarily all for Fufang. There's, a, there's some city components to it, but for the most part, that, that infrastructure component, the raw water, is virtually all for Fufang. And so they would have to contribute all the costs and expenses uh, their proportionate share. So it's, and I, I don't quote me on this, the exact number, but just for purposes of discussion tonight, it's 95% of the total cost, as an example. Uh, they would then have to contribute that 95% of the cost for design 
and the uh, contract amount for the construction of that raw, raw water facility. Um, the wastewater is a little bit more complicated because the city was already going forward with um, uh, the wastewater facility improvements. And so to the extent that there is some additional um, aspects of the wastewater facility that are being constructed because of Fufung, um, that would be their proportion. So in, again, I, I don't know what those proportions are, but say it's 10% of the total wastewater. Uh, they would then have to contribute 10% of the design costs and 10% of the construction costs for the wastewater facility, uh, as example. So it's basically an incremental uh, increase in cost to the city. That's what that those escrow funds are to be used for. And so what would happen is there are some offsets that, that are incorporated. So if the total proportionate amount is $10 million for uh, the raw water, there are some funds that are being sought uh, for that, for example, through the State Water Commission. That deduction, uh, well, let's say it's $3 million that the city or that the state is able to recover. That $7 million would be the amount that would be uh, deposited for um, the design and construction, as an example. And these aren't real numbers. I'm just trying to provide an example for everybody. Um, and then uh, also, if there are you know overruns or there are change orders for any of those two projects, um, Fufang would have to deposit additional amounts to cover those as well. What would happen then is once we have those those funds in place for those particular projects, we would deposit the money and we would almost immediately re, uh, uh, withdraw an amount that would be equivalent to the design costs that we would reimburse ourselves for. Uh, uh, and then as we start constructing, then as pay estimates come in, they would we'd use those escrow funds to pay that proportionate, that same percentage um, for those pay estimates for the contractor for building those those projects. So in effect, Fufang is paying in advance uh, for the construction of those two projects as opposed to uh, the city building those projects and then trying to recover them through some sort of fee, uh, water fees or wastewater fees uh, over time. They're, they're paying in advance. Um, the other aspect I want to talk about is special assessments. Uh, as you know, um, the special those costs and expenses that would be uh, subject to a special assessment aren't covered by either the letter of credit or, or wouldn't be covered by their, either those raw water or wastewater uh, costs. Those then, those special assessments get spread, those costs get spread to the benefited uh, properties, which would be Fufon, and that then becomes a lien on their property. So that's the security uh, that the city has with respect to those special assessment costs. So at the end of the day, uh, what we've got is we've got a letter of credit to assist in, in uh, providing that financial security uh, for costs and expenses that uh, for those design costs. So if we get through this and we get you know six months into the project and it gets terminated for some reason, we can turn to the letter of credit to try to, to recover those costs and expenses that have been incurred. If we get to the spot where there is then construction, um, particularly with respect to the raw water and the wastewater, then Fufang deposits those funds that would cover both the design and the future uh, construction, bearing in mind that that letter of credit still does not go away until that plant is, is completed. So that letter of credit would still be in place. We'd still have all those escrow funds in place as well and the special assessments that would be uh, imposed upon their property. I'd be happy to answer any questions. A lot of information, uh, and it is complicated, but the letter of credit and the escrow accounts are, are or, excuse me, for raw water and wastewater are intended to provide those financial securities to the, to the city. And maybe council presence. I'll just um, you have in front of you a resolution, and I was going to have Marine go over that. Uh, what specifically that is, and what it's for. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Uh, so the resolution that's in front of you tonight um, is in regards to um, it, it's it's entitled "Resolution of the Governing Body of the Applicant." Um, as uh, Todd has reviewed with you, there's several state and North Dakota um, financing programs um, for wet infrastructure projects uh, that are at below market interest rates. Um, <clears throat> Authorized by the Federal Clean Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, um, they, they, you were able to take advantage of these lower interest rates. Um, the city, we've used these programs before. Um, 
in order to access funding, though, the state requires that the governing body uh, the, uh, <clears throat> appoint a designated representative um, to coordinate the application process. Um, city Council, um, it should City Council decide to finalize any funding through these programs, though it'll come back to you for, for approval. Um, but in the past, we've had the city administrator um, be the applicant of these funds, and this is the resolution um, that would be needed to be moved forward um, for, us to, for us to move forward with that. This resolution author authorizes uh, us to apply, but not, does not bind City Council. Thank you, Ms. Storstead. Are there any comments or questions or comments from Mr. Gosted or Ms. Storstead? Yeah, Mr. Ravine. Uh, Mr. Gosted, you presented a lot of information. Is there any written pieces so that the person can come back and look at what you just stated orally? There is. I've got, uh, I got an outline that I prepared for myself. Uh, I'd encourage you to also to look at the development agreement uh, because the uh, development agreement uh, describes the letter of credit. It describes the escrow agreements. The escrow agreements are actually have already been negotiated and there are exhibits to uh, the development agreement as well. The, the only thing I would add to that is what, what you stated sometimes puts it in better lay terms to be able to understand and try to go and understand the legal part of your development agreement because you had a fairly thorough presentation. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Veen. And I could certainly try to uh, pare this down. The, the, the notes probably won't mean much to anybody reading it except for me. Uh, so I'd be more than happy to maybe summarize it as best I can in, in layman's terms, try to get it down to one or two pages uh, and, and share that with the Council. Uh, Mr. Phelan and, and the source said, the resolution that we just read, I've not seen that done before, but what's, I mean, it makes sense, I believe, to get good financing for a project. What's, why is this being brought out in this manner or fashion? Council President Sandy and, and Council Member Bean. I think it's in, in anticipation of us having conversations with state agency and then obviously we're in, in we're in the design process so i'm um, trying to finalize the best funding and it, this allows us to engage the state of north dakota and then come back with a funding package um, on all the various infrastructure pieces for for your later approval but it allows us to resolve that we you, have authority to, to work with the state agencies and bring that back to you haven't you always done this and mr veen we have done this similar app resolution of application in the past um, for these type of programs so and i can i believe for the water um, okay I, I mean you listed all of that and it's kind of common sense i think so i think by the last major project we used uh, srf loans was uh, with the water treatment plant where our 50 percent was matched by a drinking water srf program that we used so, Mr. Phelan, this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, I noticed that it's not online. Can you add it to the, to the yes. staff report no. under whatever it is, whatever we're on, 5, 2.5? Yeah. Yes. I, we intended it. We got it done this afternoon. We intended to get it gone there. Yeah. The other thing is all these um, recommendations, there is a two-week period of time, so we, we have until September 6th. So if something changes in between the two mm -hmm. weeks, obviously we'll be here to, before final action. Great. President Sandy, yeah. this is actually listed Mr. under 2.6, the, the PowerPoint a, presentation. It is way down under 2.6. Thank you. It is on 2.6. Thank you, everyone. So we'll get it to the right item. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Um, any other comments on 2.5, the resolution? Move, move approval. So, Mr. Weigel moves approval. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Any further comments, Mr. Reed? Yeah, I, according to what I brought up on the website, this is 2.7. This is item 2.5, State of North Dakota Water Funding Resolution. Yeah, but on the website, when I bring it up, it's 2.7, the State of North Dakota? I think if you refresh it, we actually moved it ahead of those Yeah. Items. If you refresh the website. Okay. We, we we jiggle the agenda around quite often. We've, we felt because uh, this item rule is better in front of all the the items, the items. Because, uh, on the financing. So you could uh, 
approve this recommendation in advance of talking through all the specific projects. Okay, I re I refreshed it and it changed the, Great. Okay. the order of the events. So. so there's a motion and a second. Any other comments regarding item 2.5? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 26, construction manager at risk, pre-construction services agreement, city project 8483, wastewater treatment facility improvements. Mr. Phelan. Right. Council President Sandy, members of the committee of the whole. As you recall, um, this uh, city council did approve uh, upon you know advertising, interviewing uh, the firm of PKG uh, to move forward as a construction manager at, at risk. And you know we, we discussed lots of reasons why we want to do it. Supplies, chain issues, lack of general contractors that are really in the game of doing wastewater, sophisticated wastewater treatment and water treatment um, plant um, projects. PKG is out of uh, Fargo. They have worked at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and so we're, we're upfront pleased that they, they did propose on it, uh, if anyone was going to propose on it. As part of that proposal, we did ask, for, it's a two-part, we asked for pre-construction services, and pre-construction services are intended to work with the design engineers, in this case, that's A2S and Black and & Beach, work with the design engineers at 30, 60, 90 percent of design to really work on the constructability of the specifications and so that we can get the very best bids that we can as part of having a, a constructive way to uh, construct this. I think they've already added a lot of benefit on how we should approach this um, particular project. But as part of that advertisement, uh, firms are required to um, pro provide a, uh, a number for what their pre-construction services um, would be. And their envelope when we owned, uh, opened it was 525,000, which we, which is in range with what we we thought with uh, PKG. And so, really, that's our fee, upfront fee for them to work on the design with A2S and, and Black and Beach and others, as part of their pre-construction services. So they'll be working with A2S and Black and Beach at 30% design, 60% and 90%. And when we get to 90% design, we'll be ready to move forward with. Um, all the various bids that you will approve. So I think we have them on board sooner rather than later and probably sooner than we brought the, the construction manager at risk with the water treatment plant at this point in time. So they're ready to go and, and start working with our, our engineering firm. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Any questions related to the CMAR wastewater treatment facility? Mr. V? I have a Microphone, please. Originally, when we were talking about um, the wastewater process, this has been in the works for years, right? And when was the original, when were we thinking originally we would be doing this project? About four years out, is that what it would be? Yeah. Uh, Council President Sandy and Council Member um, Bean, we intended, uh, we probably intended to have some work done this year. So remember, we had four phases. We had phase one through four. And we, what we had as part of the um, facility plan is that um, the city council approved moving forward with three of those four. The third phase was biosolids, and so we, we, we didn't move forward with that. But phase one was some of the uh, piping, and some of the renewal of the existing wastewater treatment plant. So that was some piping improvements, that was a backup generator, and it was various other improvements as part of that. That was estimated about um, almost $14 million as part. That was meant to be really that upfront um, project that we would work on right away. So we would have likely bid that this fall for upcoming construction. I think what's really moved it um, further ahead is that um, updating the capacity of the, of the treatment plant and that's what's moved forward sooner. We were gonna, at the time, and we've even come up with a different concept of which PKG did concur with. As you recall, we were gonna look at retrofitting all those four reactor tanks mm -hmm. and ad ad not only renew them, but also add additional capacity. Really what came back is um, the, the timeline that we were under, cost, constructability. Uh, it wasn't really a tenable process in, in various ways. So um, we have this uh, um, bioreactor um, project where it's gonna be a separate facility that will integrate into the existing facility and that was seen as a better way to move forward uh, from a constructability, from a timeline, but also from a cost, both capital cost, um, but also an operation of cost, and then also for a further expansion process too. So as we as they do, and I think the final piece was um, 
future regulations that we would do this. So we are looking at a, a and PKG concurred with that. They, they did come back to say, you know, to go back into a reactor tanks that we have um, structurally, there were some concerns. So they, they did concur with this is a better approach on um, expanding our, our treatment capacity. Mr. Veen, further questions? Um, yeah, just I think the final one, and I think you answered some of that. I mean, what's happened is we've had to increase the capacity uh, now because of the Fufung project, and then we've expedited it somewhat also for that purpose, right? It's, it's true. I think we used up our capacity. This is where even Council President Sandy, you, uh, a couple of years ago, he said, oh, what do you mean we're out of capacity? And uh, I think two major things happened. Number one, we integrated with East Grand mm -hmm. Forks. That, that's about, um, on, on average, about a million gallons per day that we added into our, our wastewater treatment plant, and that was, I don't know, 2017. And then we also, Red River Buyer Finder came on, on board too, and so that added another, you know, 500,000 a million gallons per day. And, and the, the difference with the East Grand Forks flow was more of a, um, well, it's been more, more strength than we anticipated. Um, the Red River Buyer Refinery that's undergoing some renewal now, um, they added more of a strength capacity. And so with those two entities, it really uh, used up a lot of our capacity. But um, we did have a lot of excess capacity when we did this wastewater treatment plant because it's 20, it's 20 years old and we just have finally used up all the reserve capacity with those two major um, additions that we made. So I think now really we're looking at future capacity. Right now, if um, as part of the de current design, we're looking at adding uh, five MZD of capacity. And so right now, um, Fufang is about two and a half to three million gallons per day Good. to the system. And so we'd have a reserve capacity of uh, another, we'll say two to two and a half MGD. Um, we also, when we build these basins, they are gonna build them to a seven MGD capacity, but or I think seven and a half, but we're not gonna put all the component parts in these basins. So we'll have component parts in five of it, but the, re, um, the remaining, you know, two and a half million gallons per day of the, the MBR facility, we'll be able to put new um, component parts in those, but the concrete will be there. And so that's, that's our strategy moving forward, is that we will have excess capacity um, beyond Fufan, but it won't be a large uh, capacity. The other thing we're gonna know as we go through the design of this process, as Mr. Gosset has talked about with the escrow account, when we talk about the wastewater treatment plant, their component part of it, that goes, that's the money that goes into the escrow account. So all the things we're doing from a design, from a construction management to a bidding, that's all part of that um, escrow account. And if we move forward through um, the rate remaining of this year and into next, and for whatever reason, Fufang doesn't move forward, we may look at the capacity issue on this. Is you know if if they're two and a half million gallons per day, is it going to come in because they're not going to move forward? That'll move. That, you know we may have to alter the capacity question, but I think we have the right technology and the right uh, infrastructure design moving forward. And that was the last one question. The concern I have: if it did move forward, would it be better to wait until we see what happens with the lawsuit and, and, and the CPS? I think uh, just because we need to make these improvements, like a, a lot of like, and I, I noticed some of the renewal processes. I think with the design itself, um, I think it's good that we work in parallel so that as we look at um, having refining the cost of this, whether it's a seven and a half MGD. Uh, component part or we shave it down. At least we're moving forward in the design process trying to figure out how best to bid it, how, how best to get component parts that we're gonna need, regardless of the size. So um, I think to stop something uh, when we need to move forward, uh, whenever you stop momentum on, on things, it's harder to course correct and it's hard to, harder to adapt when you're, you're standing still. So I, I would recommend as we move through this fall that we continue to move forward with the design process of this wastewater treatment because we need to do it as part of the greater good of the of the citizens of Grand Forks. And I think that's part of it. I think we, you know, we're ultimately gonna need to do it. There's no question yeah. about it. It's just the timing of when we should do it that really matters. And, and maybe it would impact capacity somewhat too. I mean, depending on what happens down the road. So that's the struggle I have with this. I, th I think we've moved it along 
you know, as it probably should, but timing right now is a concern. That's I think uh, Council President saying, I think on the CFS, we intend to have, uh, by all reports, by the um, Fufang should have a uh, information by the end of the month, the 31st, so we're going to have an answer on that. Um, I think uh, the district court case, we're going to have an answer, I would suspect, you know, in the near term, I would say. But, you know, if it comes back with CFS and, you know, it, it's going to be a long, prolonged um, review, I think that'll be an additional consideration as we lead into uh, a final um, move forward in design on September 6th. I th so I still think we have time. We're going to know more information. And even if something came back in September, October, November, we'd come back to the city council as things have changed and, and we need to adapt. But I think on the design itself, we got the right technology, we have the right infrastructure. It may be a, a size issue as we move forward, but right now, um, Let's uh, move forward, I think. Any other questions regarding item 2.6? Um, Mr. Phelan, I, I think uh, logic says uh, we move forward, and I, I question if we aren't, if, only, if we're only building a little two and a half million of additional capacity, maybe there should be an additional discussion about that. I don't know what adding another million, I don't know what that means in terms of dollars, right? So perhaps uh, I'm sure Mr. Gaddy can whittle that off his head in two minutes and I'll, I'll call him and talk to him about it. So. That sounds good. And we'll have some time. So if you want to know, we'll, we'll update that. And again, you know, if you move forward, uh, if you move forward after September 6th, you're going to get plenty of updates at 30, 60, 90 percent of design so you're going to you're going to see multiple updates on where we're at with cost and capacity um, over the next few months too great thank you any other uh is there a motion or a, mr waggle moves approval is there a second anyone second hmm. yes no, i'll second Thank you, Mr. Weber. Is there further comment? There's a motion and second on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries Osowski and Veen dissent. Thank you. Uh, item 2.7, final design and bidding engineering services agreement for city project 50 or 8569, Grand Forks Wastewater Treatment Facility Phase 2 design. Mr. Phelan. Council President Sandy and members of uh, the community hall. This is the associated uh, design engineering group that I spoke of with uh, A2S and, and Black and & Beach. And it uh, really um, working together with the construction manager at risk um, is with this design agreement. It's about an 8% um, design agreement, which is um, in line with generally it uh, for our wastewater treatment plant project. And right now, uh, the, the facility is projected. It's a it's a 5.12 million dollar contract with A2S and Black and Beach, and uh, right now the wastewater treatment plant construction cost is estimated at 58 million, and so uh, it's really important for us to work with the construction manager, work with the design team, to really refine those costs and and all those sorts of things. And certainly we're, that's why we're going to be working with our state agencies to to let them know. Uh, about concerns about cost inflation and, and maintaining affordability and having them provide the best, um, you know, incentives that we can as part of moving forward with the project. But lots of updates on this through through the fall and into the winter. Great, thank you, Mr. Phelan. Any questions? But the I just, I, again, I think the timing, the timing is it's an issue of timing. I think the process is good. Thank you, Mr. Veen. Is there a motion by Weigel? Is there a second? Well, second. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries uh, Osowski and Veen dissent. Item 2.8, create uh, district for project 8575, district 594, waterman for PME addition, highway 81, phase one. Mr. Danielson, good evening. Thank you, President Sandy, members of the committee. So this project was mentioned in the presentation that you guys just got when you started going through the timeline. We're looking at the water main build out now. This one's phase one and we're considering phase one of the water main build out to primarily be along 27th Avenue North with a connection down on Highway 81 to tie in and loop the water main as well as another connection up on North 30th Street to follow through with some commitments we made to the SNS group up there as far as providing them water service and fire protection by the end of 2023. Um, 
the intent of the water main up here, just like any other area in the city, water service for the properties as well as fire protection. So there's nothing different there. Like we mentioned, this is supposed to be phase one of three. Phase two is expected to go from 27th Avenue North up to 33rd Avenue North. And then phase three is expected to go from 33rd Avenue North all the way up to the northern extent of the annexation. Uh, typical city policy for a water main project in the city is 100% special assessment, but the city council has elected to go with a funding strategy of 40% city coverage or city assumption of the special assessments and 60% assumption on some anticipated federal programming that we just went through in the presentation. Um, it's also worth noting that typically the city covers the cost on an oversized water main. So anything over eight inches on a water main, the city will typically do a cost share to cover everything over that eight inches. And that 40% that we're assuming of those special assessments is likely pretty close to that 40% on this project because we're gonna be installing a 16 inch water main. So that's out on this project. It's some pretty large water main. The construction cost of the project is estimated at about 1.4 million at this point. And like we looked at with the timeline, this project is likely gonna be bid sometime in next spring, probably in the March area. It kind of times out where this project is in the same geographical location as a lot of the other projects that you've already seen tonight. So it just makes sense to kind of keep them all together and keep them in a single bid package. So. Happy to answer any questions. City's or staff's recommendation is to approve the engineer's report, create the district, and direct staff to continue preparing plans and specs, advertise for construction, and then also approve any necessary budget amendments for the project. Thank you, Mr. Danielson. Any questions regarding the project? Mr. Weigel moves approval. Is there a second? Second by Veen. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 2.9, plans and specs for project 8485, district 589, stormwater pond for highway 81 and the associated area. Mr. Danielson. Thank you, President Sandy, members of the committee. So this project, we're going over to the stormwater pond now. This stormwater pond is meant to serve for all the current and future needs for stormwater runoff up in the annexation area along highway 81. This is a project that's already been in front of you guys a couple times for the creation of a special assessment district and a task order for design engineering services. Um, this one, like Mr. Phelan mentioned, is on a little bit of a more accelerated timeline than the rest of the projects, just because we actually can with this project do some work this winter. So just to get things moving, we kept this one on a little bit tighter of a timeline. Since last time you've seen it, there's been no significant changes in the construction costs. We're still looking at about 3.7 million on the construction. And unless there's any questions, staff's recommendation is to approve the plans and specifications as well as uh, reimbursement resolution that Ms. Storstead went over. Thank you, Mr. Danielson. Questions or comments about the stormwater special assessment? Mr. Weigel moves approval. Is there a second? Second by Veen. Any other comments? Hearing none, all, the, all those in favor all signify by members. saying aye. Aye. No. Opposed, same no. sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. I have 2.10, engineering task orders for A, project 8488, sanitary master lift station number 50 in Force Main, B, project 8575, district 594, water main for Peony addition and highway 81 area phase one, C, project 8578, raw water supply, and D, project 8580, sanitary force main from lift station number 50 to North 42nd Street, the Severson, project A. Good evening, President Sandy, members of the committee. So I have a number of task orders here and I'll introduce each of them and then I have a couple of our consultants here to go over them more in depth. So the first one in front of you is 8488 and that's the sanitary mist lift station 50 as seen up here uh, north of 27th Avenue. Um, this is a booster station that will take care of the industrial flow and then also item D is the 8580 the sanitary forest made from this lift station to 42nd Street as that is phase one. And then I'll turn it over to Dale Burgum with WFW to kind of go over why we're building a booster station. Thank you. Dale, good evening. Good evening, President Sandy and members of the Committee of the Whole. I'm just gonna give you a, just a quick brief background a little bit on sanitary flow and how we're at where we're at right now. Real simplified, basically when you flush your uh, waste down the stream, it goes out your house or 
building, it goes through a sanitary service lead, goes into sanitary gravity sewer. From that gravity sewer, it goes miles to the nearest sanitary lift station. There it dumps into what's called a wet well, or basically an open uh, concrete cylinder. It's closed at the top, but it's, it's a cylinder. Uh, from there, we actually take and pump it from there, and we pump it into a force main system, which is a, a pressurized pipe system. That pressurized pipe system then is all interconnected. Um, the map shows all the red lines there are actually our force main pipes that we have. We have some master, we have two master stations then on that pipeline system. One is uh, pump station 17, which is up on the north end there at Columbia Road and Highway 81. And then the other one is at the industrial park off of 17th Avenue South. Both of those master stations are on that same system. Either one can overtake. If one dies, the other one picks up and is able to pump it. We have two separate, two separate force mains out to the treatment plant then. So basically, it's just like a straw sucking out of a straw and pumping out the other end. And basically, it just allows all of our other stations to operate with less flow. Because if you had one of the stations down by the river here and you had to pump all the way to the treatment plant and then fight against all the other stations, the head would be so high, you need a lot more horsepower and a lot more effort to do that. So this is a really good, effective system to get it out there. Currently, the industrial waste is mixed with domestic. Industrial waste is the waste that's coming out of our industries. Um, a lot of the industrial waste is a low flow. I think there's actually eight permits uh, for industrial waste. Some of them are based on classifications of what they're doing as far as what they're hauling. We have two large industrial waste users. Um, both of them are in the north end here. Um, Simplot and RRB. Um, with that, Simplot's flow in our, goes to lift station 22, which is actually pumped. It doesn't go through a master. It actually just pumps into that force main and runs it all the way out there. But it does mix with the domestic flow. And then lift station 46 was constructed, and that's where the RRBR waste goes into that one and runs out there. Currently, both of those stations, lift station 22 was probably constructed in the in the late 60s. Um, it's been rehabbed. The last rehab was in 2000. We've done a couple of minor rehabs since then. But it's to the point where it needs significant re repair. It wasn't designed for the flow that we're pushing through it, but we're able to get that with the pumps and controls that we have. We can actually push a lot of flow through there. Um, lift station 46 was a recent construction. And with the flow that comes in there from the industry that we have from that one, it's impacting that station significantly too. A lot of the differences in, in the flow with the industrial ones that are causing a problem is the, is the material that they're pumping to us, the temperatures it's pumped at, and everything else. What happens is that waste comes in there. As the waste is traveling to the lift station, it starts degrading, creates H2S. H2S then, when it dumps into the wet well, it comes into the air. We have to deal with it in there. It starts corroding and starts eating our concrete up, eating our comp pipes up, eating our pumps up. So we have a process of dealing with all that. When we started looking at this area up north here, the city had envisioned one pump station, lift station 49, which is uh, going to be up by the pond there. And the original plan was to make it a large station based on the flows that we have in here. Because part of our deal that we have to deal with is the water comes in, it goes into this wet well. Well, if a pumps die or two, three pumps die, and all of a sudden we need to get service out there, we only have so much time. So by going into those wet wells, it becomes more of a problem or for the maintenance staff to try and keep them up. We found that the booster stations now, we can actually put four or five pumps in there, have generators for them, everything else. One pump clogs, the next two or three will be online and ready to take off. So we started looking at the process and said, you know, with this area and what we have around it, we know lift station 22 is getting to the point where it needs rehab. Lift station 46, even though it's new, is really had some significant problems. We said, you know, what's a better solution to this? We kind of went through the numbers and looking at the numbers with a large station in the 49 to start with versus installing 50 and making 49 smaller. Actually, when we were all done, the numbers actually were very, very close, so close that I couldn't tell you the difference between the two of them. I couldn't without bidding it out. Um, so with that, we kind of ended up moving to that process. So now, 50 now we're looking at, and part of the process that we're looking at is that 50 will, will handle the flow from the corn mill, but it's also designed to handle the flow from Simplot, 
Red River Biorefinery, any other large user that you're going to have down there. It's going to be a, a, a booster station, which then basically keeps the pipe, the sewage in the pipe. It doesn't let it come into the atmosphere. So we reduce a lot of corrosion. Um, we get the producers who are producing it to pump it so we know once they can pump it, we can pump it. If they can't pump it, it's not going to make it to us, and then we don't have a problem with it. So it's kind of a win-win situation. And it was, uh, so that's kind of how we ended up at the booster station idea. I guess with that, I'll open up any other questions based on that. Any questions regarding the pumping of sewage? <laughs> I gave you the short version. <laughs> no. Yeah, thanks. It sounds like a great engineering problem solved with some good engineering skills. Um, any comments regarding Project A, the sanitary master lift station number 50 in Force Main? Anyone want to move this forward? Uh, I have a quick question if I may. Mr. Walker? Um, in fact, this goes for much of the conversation we've had for the last uh, while now. Um, if there is a, new, uh, a fertilizer plant that comes to town, what does that do with our current plans for wastewater treatment? What does that do in regard to the proposal that's just been laid out? And this was uh, terribly important information. Thanks for the, the presentation, making it so, so clear. As it relates to lift station 50, if it's in the area, 50 will have the capabilities to handle that flow. 50 will also be built up with some extra valving in there. We'll tie into the force main, the existing force main, plus it's going to have a new parallel force main that'll run all the way up to the treatment plant. With a valving in there, we'll have different ways of being able to take the sewage, mix it if we want. If one force main breaks, we can turn it in, put it in the other one. So we solve a lot of future problems also. So your, your current uh, proposal actually anticipates the possibility of a fertilizer plant coming to town? If the plant's up in this area. Uh, council member or Vice President uh, Weber, maybe I could, um, I think what Dale would, if you look at uh, the drawing right here is that um, Simplot is, oh, we got Highway 2 right here. So Simplot's in this area, right, in this area. So, you know, it can be serviced this area. This area is a greenfield right now. So I think what uh, Dale would look at is that, for example, if you had a soybean crushing or you had some other agribusiness, that um, lift station 50 could serve this area along with biorefinery, JR Simplot and the Fufong facility. But with the, um, the other part that's really important is that uh, we've integrated East Grand Forks as part of the wastewater system is when you looked at what the nitrogen fertilizer plant, they were looking at taking wastewater reuse or gray water. So the important part of them is they're, they're less of a, they're more of a taker of our wastewater. And so the important part of this is when you look at this force main that goes along the north uh, side of the city, is that we, we need to locate somebody that, an entity like the fertilizer plant that needs wastewater reuse along that pipeline because that's how we're going to distribute the, the gray water that we're going to get pay, we're going to get paid for and that we would rather have someone take it as opposed to us treating it so i think we're well aligned with our agribusiness park up here from a wastewater per perspective but also from a gray water perspective because it's all aligned in, along our north um, end of the city so this all helps us to uh, perform our, our, our role as a regional center in the middle of uh, ag, um, both in the present and the foreseeable future. Right? Yes. Yep. All, all the cards have aligned, and maybe some of it was strategic, and some of it was just how the city developed over the years. And we're just building upon what our forefathers and mothers have done uh, to get us to where we are today. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. And Ms. Severson? Move on to the next one. No. Okay. Well, Mr. Fillon, do you want to take these separately or discuss that, or should we take them all at one? I think you've already gone through the, you might as well, I would vote on each one separately. Yeah, that's what I was I'll move approval. Thanks, Mr. Weber. Is there a second? Second by Weigel. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. Motion carries uh, Osowski and Veen dissent, and uh, for the record, Ms. Osowski voted nay on 2.9 as well. 
Thank you. Uh, 10B, please. So this task order is with for the water main that uh, Christian talked about for the phase one. Uh, it's with AE2S in the amount of 130,512. Any comments or questions? A motion by Weigel. Is there a second? Second by V. No, second. No. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Masowski dissents. Uh, 10C, please. So this task order is with AE2S as well for design, bidding, and construction for the raw water. So this is for phase one as well, going roughly from where that booster station is at up to 42nd Street, as that will be phase one. Phase two will continue on from 42nd Street to the uh, water treatment plant. All right, thank you. Comments or questions about uh, 10C? Wago moves approval. Is there a second? Second. Second, uh, second by Lunsky. Any other comments? Uh, just, just yeah. uh, Mr. Bean? One very quick cause, comment. Uh, the, the raw water access for, for Fufang has been an issue with me, and it still is there, and I'm not in favor of this. So. Okay, very good. Any other comments? Any none? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. aye. Motion passes. Fien Nosowski dissent and uh, Project 10D. Okay, one more. This is the sanitary lift station. They're force main from that same lift station 50 to 42nd Street, similarly to the raw water. Uh, this is phase one. Phase two will go from 42nd Street out to the wastewater treatment plant. And this is with AE2S in the amount of 158,363. Thank you so much. Comments or questions? Motion by Weigel. Is there a second? Well, second. Second by Weber. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. No. Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Wasowski and Veen dissent. Uh, I just had one announcement. Thank you very much, Ms. Severson. Uh, Mr. Phelan, thank you for noting at last uh, council meeting last week that I'm having a ward meeting uh, September 1st, Thursday, September 1st from 5 to 7 through the Laris Center. Uh, everyone's welcome. I'm taking on uh, comments or questions related to uh, issues in Ward 6 or anyone else is welcome to show up should they like to. Mr. Phelan, something bad? Since Council Member Kavami's not here, he's having one on Monday, I think the 29th of August, and, he, and that one will be at Fire Station 5, which is adjacent to 40, 47th, yeah, 47th Avenue. Yeah, 47th Avenue. Uh, Mr. Bernstrom yeah, is going to get those advertised along with however you want to get the word out. So those are two that are scheduled next week. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Move, motion by Weigel. Is there a second? My Veen. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. Aye. Yes. Post same sign. Motion carries. We're adjourned. Thanks.